Uh, good afternoon. I'm going to talk uh, a bit about the background of, of why I built my diesel bike and then go on to some of the technical details and photographs of, of how I actually built it. Um, uh, the presentation. Uh, first of all, why? Um, I mean, we all like a technical challenge, otherwise I don't think anyone would be at the EMF camp. Um, it, it is quite technical, there's, there's, there's a lot of things I'll talk about in a moment to actually getting a vehicle on the road, as well as actually doing the mechanical couplings. Um, for some people it's the novelty, um, there's, there's more than a few around. Um, I mean, it is unique, but it's not what drives me. And uh, the, the main thing is the fuel economy, uh, mostly because there's, there's more energy in in a pint of diesel than there is petrol, and secondly, the way the engine uh, creates the power is, is it's more efficient as, uh, anyway. Um, so most diesel bikes have an economy of somewhere between 100 and 200 miles, an hour, uh, miles per gallon. Um, th there are some that claim to go further than that on a gallon, but they're actually really quite slow. Um, uh, my bike, uh, uh, has a fuel economy of about 145 to the gallon. And the presentation is failing me. Uh... Would anyone know what to have to get to F11. No. Function F11, no. We good? Ah, oh, you still got the order. In. That one. That's as good as we can see as we want to go. Good as we go. Okay, we'll, we'll go with that. Um, so the, the economy I'm getting is about 145 miles to gallon, which um, when I tell people I meet in South Wales, that that's enough to get from South Wales to the centre of London on a single gallon of fuel. Uh, and that is on the motorway cruising at uh, an acceptable 55, 60 mile an hour, uh, which is the speed that the lorries move at, so you're not actually holding anyone up. Um, and uh, although it does have a top speed of, of about 72 miles an hour. Um, the next obvious question people usually ask me is, is it a new idea? No one else has done this, they've never seen a diesel bike. Um, and the, the truth is, is diesel Enfields uh, have been made from the 1970s, uh, mostly in, in India. Uh, in fact, the only place where diesel bikes have been produced in mass production was India. However, they stopped um, only a few years ago because of um, uh, pollution and uh, environmental laws that they've introduced over there. Um, the other thing is there's a, a small company in, in, uh, in Germany called Sommer, or Summer, and they've uh, hit their target, I think earlier this year, of producing 500 diesel Enfields. Uh, the only other thing that came close to uh, mass production is uh, a bike called the Trax, which is a more of an end, enduro type, uh, sort of high dirt bike type uh, build, which is called the Trax, uh, the T800 CDI bike. And that was based on the smart car engine. Um, I believe about 20 of those were made before he went out of production and stopped. Um, he had at least, what, between five and six years development putting that on the road. Uh, and it looks like a new machine that you would buy rather than a, a self-build kit. Um, and they're very nice machines, but um, I'm not sure why he came out of production, but I, th I think one of the concerns he was having was if you, if you spend close to 18,000 euros on a machine, you want the kind of um, warranty and service expectation of something you buy from Yamaha or Honda or Ford. And if you're even a very professional but small company, that is a very difficult target to hit. Um, 
And uh, the, the last thing is, is most bikes are produced as uh, personal projects or some for some friends, which we you know, consider a small run. Um, as far as how many are around, um, I try every year to go to the, the English meeting, uh, which is a weekend convention, uh, much like the EMC, but for people with diesel bikes, and approximately 40 bikes turn up. Uh, uh, I'd say over half of them are self-built by the people who ride them there. Um, and uh, then there's the German diesel motor Treffen um, in Ham in Germany, and I, I've been to that about four times. And many more bikes turn up there, so on an on a average, average year, they'll have about 50, uh, 50 bikes turn up. Uh, the, the tools I've used, I mean, I've, I live in a terraced house. I've done most of my work in, in a shed in the garden um, because it's a, a fairly big house. Uh, I, I often do work in, in the downstairs spare room uh, because I, I don't have a garage and I live in a city and I can't afford to rent a garage um, separately. Um, and the tools basically are hammers, spanners, hacksaws. I use angle grinder for cutting, shaping, and grinding metal. Uh, I have a pillar drill for drilling decent holes. I mean, a pistol drill is good, but it, it really just uh, doesn't cut the mustard when you need to drill parallel holes um, in, in flat bars and things. Um, I have a welder. Um, I now have quite a nice DC um, uh, a stick welder. I have a MIG as well. But MIG welders are quite expensive to feed gas, um, especially if you're doing slightly more than a weekend job, because the small disposable bottles you'll buy from Halfords, or I, I don't know if Screwfit still sell them, are very expensive per unit of gas. And then the big bottles have astronomical uh, annual rent, or the rent-free big bottles, um, uh, again, are prohibitively expensive to buy if, if you're doing it for a hobby. Uh, the other tool you need for doing something quite as advanced as this sort of conversion is access to a lathe. Uh, when I built this one, uh, I had a friend with a, with a very big lathe who's into projects and, and mad ideas. I don't know if he's in here now. No, he's, oh, he's hiding. Um, so I, I, I would ride up to my, my mate's house with all the bits of material and measurements on the back of uh, cornflakes packets and uh, templates. And, and do all the lathing up there. And I've since bought my, my own lathe, which I'll show you later on. Um, this is my shed. It's about 10 by eight feet. It's very small. Uh, it's my current project in there. Uh, I've got a, a slightly better photo of that, but not a complete one. And you can see the general tooling I have available. Um, in the, the, the red thing in the middle uh, is a pipe, pipe bender. You can see the welder and the gas bottle in the corner. Uh, the lathe, pillar drill, there's a miniature anvil on the floor. Um, I really want a bigger anvil, but um, I think back problem would mean I'd never get it into the shed. Um, so that's the sort of tooling I've used to produce this. And, and the other thing is, is nothing, that, n n nothing overly special other than maybe the lathe. Um, because I live in a terrace house, I have no rear access to the house, and I'm on a hill. So everything that's in my shed has to come down a flight of stairs, um, which is why I use the spare room for most of the major assembly, um, so I can get it out onto the street. And this is, um, this is the lathe being delivered, which is quite a, a task. I thought you might be interested to see how you get a lathe down a flight of steps. Um, so the uh, main technical problems uh, of, of building a, a diesel bike are the power and engine choice. Very interesting, you've probably talked for hours about that, uh, because you need enough power to get you moving, and you need it to be light and small enough to put in a two-wheeled motorcycle, and, um, and, and, and that's a, a balance that's tricky to hit, because all the automotive engines are really quite large, and even in cars, it's only very, very recently that the engines are built for a lightweight uh, design. They're all very heavy, chunky, over-designed, uh, run forever type, type of things. And the smaller engines of, of the sort of 10 to 20 horsepower are all stationary engines for stationary applications like generators or industrial equipment that doesn't need any light weighting such as, as diggers and, and commercial street sweepers and things. Um, uh, and I'll mention in a moment why I picked this particular engine. Um, and also the speed, uh, because that's important because you need to be going fast enough on the road to be safe. And that's, that's, 
a problem I've seen with a, with a lot of the Enfield conversions, they use a single cylinder diesel engine, which produces anywhere between three and a half and 10 horsepower, depending on, on, on the, the capacity and, and, and how modern it is. Um, and having ridden one on the road, I'd say that 10 horsepower is not enough to keep up with modern traffic. And with the impatience of, of the general public to slow vehicles, it, it, it can often put you in a dangerous situation when you're in a small, uh, vulnerable, vulnerable vehicle and you've got people overtaking you because they need to get somewhere faster than you. Um, so you have to be going fast enough. And again, that hits the power and weight and size. Um, the, the gearbox, uh, that's uh, again a, a critical choice. On, on this particular one, I've used the BMW gearbox, which is an inline gearbox because the engine uh, is longitudinally in, in, in the frame. Uh, and, and, sorry, faces this way, goes around. Um, uh, and, and that's why there's so many Enfields. That's why when, when you mention diesel bikes or do an internet search, you'll see Enfields come up time and time again. And that's because th they, they were one of the last produced bikes that had a separate gearbox and a separate engine. Uh, and that makes it easy because all you need to do is couple the gearbox input to the engine, which can be done with a belt to drive, uh, sorry, chain drive, uh, or I don't know if anyone's done it, but a gear drive if you, if you really wanted to. Um, and, and that makes building it easier if, if you don't have a terribly uh, advanced mechanical background. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll be covering the gearbox in, in more detail because that's the main crucial engineering part of, of getting getting this particular bike done. And the chassis, um, and I'll, I'll mention a bit about uh, the regulations in a minute. The chassis is important because um, it has to contain everything. It has to be strong enough to, to support any extra weight you put on it. And, um, and you can run into legislation issues if, if you're going to do it, all your paperwork uh, correctly. Um, so coming on to the parts used in this particular project, um, I've picked a Kabuta Z482 engine. It's 500cc water-cooled twin-cylinder engine. It produces um, 13 and a half horsepower. Um, but depending on which specification you read, um, that varies between 12 and, and about 15. So, you know, really, I, I'm not entirely sure, and I've not bothered to put it on a dyno tester to measure it. And it produces that power at 3,500 RPM. Uh, but interestingly, this engine is spec'd for a free running speed of 3,800, so it gives you slightly more confidence in over-revving it if, if you ever wanted to. Um, the frame I've chosen is BMW R80. Oh, but back about the engine is um, most of the stationary engines people use are, are slightly old, and a lot of them are out of production. A, a lot of small diesel engine producers over the years uh, have been absorbed by larger corporates, um, so, so the accessibility of, of smaller engines over the years has actually reduced. Um, I mean, one of them is, is uh, a rugger field. I uh, used to make quite a nice air-cooled air uh, twin-cylinder engine. They were bought up by Lombardini, which is an Italian company, which means the whole range of small air-cooled uh, diesel engines that rugger field used to be are now out of production because uh, Lombardini pre uh, prefer water-cooled engines. So, you know, it's, it's, it's the way it goes. Um, and, and this engine uh, is, is used in um, uh, street sweepers. Uh, it's used in, in uh, industrial garden machinery. Um, and more interestingly, it's fitted to the, the little French uh, micro car that does about 45 mile an hour that uh, has probably been the, the butt of a lot of Top Gear jokes uh, over the years. Uh, and because of that, it's available in, in the breakers yards as a scrap car engine which means I can pick up a industrial twin cylinder modern engine that's still in production. I can still ring up a supplier and say, I want a spring or a crucial part for the injection pump and it will be on my doorstep next day delivery, which you can't do for a lot of stuff. So it, it makes the engine attractive. Um, uh, so the frame is BMW frame. It, um, it, it's the, the particular range of, of, of our series air-cooled engines has been in production since I think the early 70s, mid, mid 70s. And because of that, it's a chunky, well-built frame. It's strong, it's, it, you know, it's the, the, the BMW R series was, was the choice bike for globetrotters. So it's, it is a robust, um, a robust thing, as, as is the gearbox that's part of it. Um, so in this, I've used the BMW R80 frame. 
I've used the BMW gearbox transmission and rear wheel, and it's a shaft drive, which means I've got no chain maintenance to worry about. Um, and the other point of interest is my little peanut tank. Um, uh, running out of time. So the, the, the peanut tank holds about one and a half gallons, or 6.82 litres. And if I'm doing uh, on, a, on a, a cool run, if I'm doing 145 to the gallon, that's a fair range for such a small tank. And if that was on a modern petrol bike doing 45 to the gallon, it would be quite a ridiculous machine to, to go anywhere in distance. So I've come from South Wales um, all the way to here, and I, you know, I won't be worried about going to a garage um, until I get about halfway home. The other question, uh, and all statement people say, is they look at a, a modified bike and they go, oh, that's illegal, you're not allowed to do that. Um, and, and that's the general attitude to a lot of vehicle modifications, where in truth, you, you can do a lot um, and, and that's not being cheeky and it's not bending the rules. Uh, I mean, the MOT, uh, um, with, with a bike um, that's sort of a, a rat bike like this where I haven't bothered with the paint and the image and the shine, you have to find someone who does it by the book, uh, who I found, and he will look at it and you'll go, oh, it's another interesting one you brought me. And, and you'll get his tick book out and he'll check the lights and the lights will work and the horn works and the steering is in good nick and the tires are not bald and it's not dripping oil and the suspension goes up and down and the brakes which there's a machine for testing work and you get to the end and go there, there goes the ticket um, because it's a test a safety check on the day um, and believe it or not most things on this work even though you can probably see the, the rear lights are in a bit of a sorry state because I strap all my camping stuff to it every week every other weekend um, uh, and this only needs an MOT as, as a modified vehicle because um, I've not cut, altered, adapted or shaped any of the frame parts. The main structure of the bike is the same and I've had many lengthy conversations with people in DVLA offices saying what do I need to do to register my custom vehicle properly and we have a big conversation um, and you have to ring up many times because you get a different answer every time you ring the DVLA, it's quite frustrating but if you play the game and ring them up and keep note of what they're saying, the key points, you, you, you get get an answer eventually. Uh, because I've not cut or altered the frame, it's, it's purely classed as an engine swap. And all I have to do is contact them and with some supporting paperwork, say uh, what fuel is, what the new CC is, because that's a tax issue, not a safety issue, very important. And I have to provide receipts, which is a security issue to make sure I'm not ringing vehicles. So I have to prove that I own the parts I've made it from and I'm not re-registering stolen vehicles. Um, and that's all the DVLA are registered about. But if you do build your own frame or modify it drastically, there's something called the MSVA, which is the Motorcycle Single Vehicle Approval Route, and that's a comprehensive test of, of roadworthiness, and it takes uh, a few hours to do. It costs, I think still it, it costs less than 200 pounds. It's a very reasonable test. The spec for that was written with the support of um, the, the motorcycling groups, the lobbyists got involved saying, oh, you can't, you can't legislate us and tell us how to, whoops, tell us how to build our machines. Uh, and they said, no, we're, we're part of Europe. Uh, as, well, as just, uh, anyway, um, we were. <laughs> and, and this is how we allow our vehicles to fit in with that whole European freedom of travel and, and everything else. And um, I mean, they, 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 there's some travelling regulations, but, but that, that allows the test to be recognised in other countries. The SVA doesn't allow you to then sell a vehicle in, in the rest of Europe um, because it doesn't meet, meet that particular country's spec. So it's for this country only, um, but it allows you to build your own vehicle. And because it was written in conjunction with the enthusiast groups and the lobbyists, firstly, it's written uh, apart from a few technical uh, power technical sections. It's written in language you can read. It's written as a manual that a largely unacademic person can follow, uh, I say apart from a couple of chapters, um, which makes it accessible. And that there is something that the pressure groups did that I'm actually quite glad of uh, to do with accessibility. And, and, and there's something in, in the law that says the law must be accessible to people. It's not a private thing. And the lobbyist groups took that to its extreme and said, okay, then you must make this manual free. You must make it accessible, and it is. It's a PDF you can download. It's updated regularly, and, and, and because of that, you can, um, you can conform. So it's a com you can conform, and there's, there's not saying, oh, well, I, I didn't know because you've made this law secret and I have to go and see a lawyer. Um, and 
the other point of overstressing that is the SVA, which is single vehicle approval for cars, which I think has recently changed name over the last few years. The pressure group didn't manage that, and you have to buy the manual off the correct government department. And last time I looked at that, it was about 30 odd pounds. So, you know, that's, that's one up for your pressure groups and, and why you should support them really, because they, they can make a, a, a subtle difference. Um, the last thing, tax um, is important, which is why you must get your registration right. And, and you know, it's, um, they, they, there's no difference in fuel type for motorcycles because it is unusual, but you must get your engine size right to be in the right taxation branch. Um, this is not the only bike I've made. I've made a couple of others, and I'll briefly just show you a couple of photographs. That's the first one I made. It's got a very heavy uh, V-twin East German engine. Uh, it's, it's quite a, a modern engine for its build. Again, again it was uh, a very uh, out of production engine. So that was less powerful than this one, weighed about two and a half times the amount. Uh, it built in East Germany before the wall came down, which meant when it blew up, um, after it had been on the road for six months, I could not mend it, and that was the end of that. Um, uh, uh, that's another one. Uh, again, it's, it's more of a rat bike. Uh, that photograph is taken in Germany. Uh, in Ham at the diesel motorbike meeting, and that has a Volkswagen 1.9 litre naturally aspirated diesel engine in it. Um, absolutely fantastic machine to ride. It was, it was like flying through the air on sort of open engine biplane. It was, it was fantastic. Um, uh, and, and, and the interesting part on that is, is there is no gearbox. In between the engine and just under what, what the battery is, I can't, I can't run and point. Um, you can see the flywheel and the starter uh, uh, gear, gear wheel on it. The clutch couples the drive shaft straight to the engine. There is no gearbox. It's like driving in top gear all the time, all the time you're moving. Um, and pulling away was a bit sluggish, not dangerously so on the road. You could, you could keep up with modern traffic and, and not have your horn blown out, uh, not being blown out by horns on traffic lights. Um, it, would, it, would, it, would, it would roll along quite easily at, uh, at about 15 to 18 mile an hour without um, juddering because it was on tick over and because the diesel engine produces a flat torque curve so the torque remains about the same through the rev range. Um, obviously as the engine speeds up the torque power means power ramps up and um, somewhere between about 45 and 70 mile an hour um, it would accelerate and move like a, like a, a really powerful uh, sports bike despite looking like a, a wreck. Um, and and, it, and that, that particular one had a top speed of 104 mile an hour. Uh, and because I've had it, had it in Germany, I can say that in front of everyone uh, <laughs> without worrying. There's, there's some cop going and going, ah, oh, yes, he's just admitted to, to something. Um, I'm out of time. Oh, are we starting late? Can I? Two minutes, right. Sorry. So that's about it. Um, the current build, going back to rebuilding the thing. So. Um, Again, building the flywheel, uh, the flywheel had to be adapted to take the, the BMW clutch and then align it to the gearbox. Um, there's some measurements. Um, I was going to talk about all this. So all the measurements have to be in alignment because it, it's two shafts that couple. You have to make sure they're absolutely facing each other, otherwise you'll rip the center out of the clutch instantly. Um, uh, you have to fit it in the frame. Again, I, I, I think I mentioned I didn't cut the frame, so I was going to talk about all this in detail. Sorry, I'm, f I'm flying through it. Um, it's making up some templates for the engine mount. Um, uh, so engine mount, out of templates, cut out with an angle grinder. Um, rule zero, never be on fire. Uh, because I'm rushing at the minute, I couldn't show you the photograph with curtains in the back room to say that this is in my spare room. There we are, there's curtains, I'm in the spare room. Um, and, and the rest of the bill, man. And, and there we are, that's, that's the, the, the complete machine. Um, the other interesting thing is uh, my other bike blew up shortly before building this. I had everything ready. I put a lot of thought into it, and a lot of the thought takes longer than actually making something. Um, and so from actually saying, right, I am actually going to start this project to uh, using it to go to work on uh, was about 10 days, 10 days of manic uh, angle grinding and running up to my mate's house and using his lathe. Um, so, uh, thank you. I'll